Welcome to Authorized Version Bible Thumper Ministries, dedicated to the gospel of Jesus Christ and preaching and teaching the word of God from the preserved and fallible King James Bible of 1611. The title of this study is What the Bible Actually Says About Women Working. Now, let me say a few things. It's a common Baptist, primarily Baptist, belief that women should never work. And what I mean by that is, is a lot of the, I mean, really it's this, it's a very wicked way of looking at things, but a lot of the ways that your IFB Baptist views women as these basically slaves, basically they have to be quiet all the time, and they're really, they're not even considered a, a teammate of sorts to the husband. The husband is a complete and utter iron fist dictator of his household. Now, as a man, you do rule the household, but the view that a lot of the IFB Baptists and everybody out there has for women is contrary to what the scriptures actually say. So one of their things is, is a woman should never work. No matter what the circumstances, she should never work outside the home. And while I do stand with very much that a woman should, is a keeper at home, we'll get more into that in just a second, it's still not exactly what the scriptures say. So we're going to go ahead and begin our exposition in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. So turn your King James Bible to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. So you see right there in verse 18, notice it says help meet, not slave or confined to home, meaning she's never allowed to go outside the home, even uh, to go get groceries, for example. Uh, that is the, the common view of a lot of the Baphlics out there is that Essentially, the woman is a slave, and she is very much confined to the home. And that is completely contrary to what Scripture says. Scripture calls the woman made for the man and help meet. She's there to help you, help meet, a teammate, not just a slave that you boss around and you treat like garbage. All right, that's what a lot of these IFB devils out there truly believe. And the new IFB is a very satanic movement. They are very much against the Jewish people. They are against the pre-tribulation rapture, the, the being caught up before in the time of Jacob's trouble. They're against a lot of very important foundational biblical doctrines that are founded in Scripture. And they contradict Scripture. They hate the Jews, contradicts Romans 11. They hate the catching away, contradicts all kinds of Scriptures, as primarily pertaining to eternal security and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the new IFB movement is a very wicked, satanic movement. And that being said, this view also traces back to other areas too, even before the new IFB. You know, it's just a very wicked view. It's not the proper way that women are viewed in Scripture. Women have a lot, there's a lot of honor there for women, as we'll see as we continue this study. And they are not slaves, and they are definitely not confined to the house and on house arrest, essentially. We'll get to more of that in just a second. But again... A wife is your companion and your friend. She's there to assist you. She's not a slave. You need to be a leader to her. But again, she's not. it's not like a slavery thing. You know, Men have the final say in their household. As a man, you are the head of, the, of your household. So you have the final say no matter what, even if you're wrong, of course. But the idea being is that your, your wife is not your slave and you're not some dictator over her like that wicked view tries to say. Go to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 to 31. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. 
She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth forth. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field, and buyeth it with the fruit of her hands. She planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the, the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for, for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen, and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up, and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. And many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. So there you have the what many would call the Proverbs 31 woman. And this is a virtuous woman. She's considered virtuous, very high, you know, that's a very great great word in the, in the Bible for a woman, virtuous. And the thing is, is um, one of the things about that passage is the uh, some of the verses that we just went over is where it says, the heart of her husband doth sh safely trust in her, so that he, ha she, he shall have no need of spoil. So first and foremost, trust your wife. If you have a budget set and everything, then trust your wife to do what you say. If you are, a, as the head of the household, you're a husband, you have a certain budget you're trying to stay under when it comes to groceries or spending certain money on certain things, uh, trust your wife to stick to that. Trust her to do the shopping and be smart about it and be able to, you know, save you the most money. You have to trust her with that. And she has to learn to, of course, abide by your, by your authority on that as well. And again... The, and then the verse following after that, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her, of her life. Amen to that. When you have a saved wife, she wants to do good for you. She wants to please you. She wants to live up to your standards as, as a man and everything and the way your household is run. She wants to do those things for you. She wants to do good for you. So, of course, be that support for her and help her to achieve that. As a, as a leader, that's part of what you do is come and... Coming next, coming up next to her and showing if there's something she needs to do, show her how to do it, and so on and so forth. That's being a team. And then also, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Now, wool and flax are clothing materials, so women should learn to make things like clothing, you know, knitting, sewing, all those types of crafty things. That's very, very good for a woman to learn, and she ought to learn it. Especially if you're a woman out there, if you're a safe sister, you know that you do want to live by these these standards right here. There's a lot of women out there who go to this very passage and they want to be this Proverbs 31 woman. And that's a good thing to aspire to. Absolutely. Uh, the thing is, is you want to start learning how to make materials, start crafting, making clothing, things like that. Like that's part of being the Proverbs 31 woman. And that's a great skill to have, by the way. Uh, making clothing and all that cool stuff. I mean, that is, uh, you know, that's really good. And, of course, in, in the olden times, you go on all day about it, people, all kinds of women made uh, their, their children, their husband, their whole families their clothes back in the old days. So, again, that's a, a wonderful thing. Wool, and wool and flax are very, very good materials, by the way. Wool is a very uh, warm material. Uh, wool is probably one of the best materials you can get out there for staying warm and everything for the winter. But, uh, again, also, and then verse, uh, see here. I believe it's verse 
verse 15. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. So, you see right there, an early riser, essentially. A uh, woman needs to, you know, try to make it a, a point to get up when you're, when you're up in the mornings. Especially if you get up early for work, to get up and start the, start the day. Being an early riser, it says giving meat to her, bringeth meat to her household. And you could say maybe that's breakfast, or maybe going and gathering things from the field to prepare meat for later on dinner, whatever you want to say. But the idea being is she's up and moving very, very early, getting an early start on her day, which is a good thing, by the way. So again, another very, very beautiful quality of a Proverbs, Proverbs 31 woman. And then also she considereth the field and buyeth it with the fruit of her hands. She planteth a vineyard. So, She's buying a field and planting a vineyard with her own money, essentially. So this idea that new that a lot of these wicked people out there, these uh, the these primarily IFB people, say, well, you know, woman's not supposed to ever leave the house. She's always supposed to be home and just be on essentially house arrest. Not with this verse. The Bible contradicts them. The Bible contradicts that 100% right here. This woman is out buying a vineyard. She's buying land. For crying out loud, and for the for the purpose of working it. Now, whether that was right where she lived with her husband, who really knows? But the idea being is that this woman is going out of the home and working during the day, and it's all for her family. I mean, it makes it very very clear that she's working for her family. So here you have right here, she's buying that field and planting a vine vineyard with her own money. Again, it contradicts this idea that. Women are just supposed to be these, you know, these people that just are slaves to the man and just can't say a word against him and also can't, uh, can't ever really do, you know, can't do anything and can't do anything to help their husband if they're in a financial bind, which we'll get to more here in a little bit. But that's not true. A woman can be a helpmeet in that way. A woman can find ways to make money to help out the household on the side. And we'll get to more of that in a little bit. But again, and also, the verse after that, she girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. So a woman should actually be trying to get, should be trying to get strong, strengthening arms. You know, work will do that to you. When you're working, especially on a homestead-style type farm, in this case, obviously a full-scale farm, uh, you, uh, you're you going to become pretty strong. Uh, it puts you in, in really good shape. It is, it, all that work out in the sun and everything, and having to carry things, heavy things back and forth to different areas, that's all going to make you strong. And it's going to, a woman will strengthen, strengthen her arms doing that kind of stuff. So, again, woman's gaining strength by working the vineyard, you know, working outside, working with her hands. And then the verse after that, she, and then uh, verse 18, she perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle, her candle goeth not out by night. So she's, Selling merchandise. She's making things and selling them. That is what we call a business. That is a business of making crafts, making these different things, and selling that merchandise. She's working. A lot of people would say, again, the new IFB especially, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name them quite a bit. They try to say that women should never do any of that, that some, it's sin and they're not right with God. Not according to this passage. I know some people will say, well, that's Old Testament. We'll get to the New Testament. But the idea being, is this is the Proverbs 31 woman. We today still go to this for an example for women. Deal with it. Throw away your preconceived notions if you truly believe this IFB lie. Because it's not true. And also, she must be charitable as well. Uh, she, perceive, uh, she, she layeth her hands to the... Uh, verse 20, she stretcheth out, her, stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. So again, having charity. Women will have charity towards people who are needy, legitimately needy, by the way. Not just every... In today's society, we can't even trust the people who claim that they're needy on the streets. The people that sit there with their signs that hold them out and say, please help me, we'll, you know, just $5 if you could spare any and all the stupid stuff they write on their signs... We can't even trust those people anymore. 
is with it, we've uh, it's been proven time and time again that those panhandlers out there they're nothing more than either drugged up people or they're people who have jobs and they're literally just standing out there to make a little extra money on the side. It's been very well documented. So we can't even trust the, the type of people that we would consider needy today uh, because we, we don't know exactly what they're going to do with that money. So in these times, it was pretty easy to tell who was needy because you think about how Jerusalem as a city was back then. These were people that were sitting in the street. You read about the, I believe it's uh, over in the Gospels, you read about Jesus walking around the, the blind man uh, or the lame man sitting there asking for alms. And everything because he's been lame since he was since he was born, and he's poor. And the, you can see back then it was actually 100% obvious that someone really was poor. They weren't just some faker. So, but charity is the idea, being charitable. She is not afraid of the snow of her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. That's verse 21. Again, you see, making high-quality clothes. Uh, when, you have, when you have a household clothed in scarlet, for crying out loud, that's some pretty warm clothing. That's good clothing. That's another thing, too, is um, something that, that my wife has shown me is that uh, clothing, good, high-quality clothing that's made out of the right materials, like 100% wool, cotton, is actually way better and will keep you much warmer and ha help with your body temperature than the type of uh, the type of synthetic fabrics like polyester or whatever whatever you you have. There's all kinds of different uh, synthetics nowadays. But the idea being is that high quality clothing made out of 100% wool and things like that, it will actually keep you a lot warmer than all these mixed fibers together. These mixed, you know, one is 50% wool, 50% polyester. It's not. It's actually not good for your body temperature. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's really it's a really fascinating thing when you kind of start to research it. But that's the idea: high quality clothing for her family, and she's making that. Her husband is known, and also the thing of wisdom as well. Verse 26, she openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. So again, women can be wise. Consider what your wife says. There's a thing that, that I used to think of is that there's this thing of, there's one. it's one thing to hearken to your wife, to do what Adam did with Eve, and allow it to actually be detrimental to you. You know, you're not supposed to listen to your to your wife all the time. Let me say that as a man, as the head, as the headship of your household, you are not to listen to your wife 100 percent of the time. She may say or have thing things or ideas that may be coming from the right place, but they're actually not the right thing to do. And you, as the man, have to be able to identify that and have to say, you know, be the head of your household and, and put your foot down and say no when you need to say no. But that doesn't mean, again, contradicting this idea that women can never speak or at least give some advice this contradicts that as well because they you can get sound advice from your wife your wife can't actually have wise things to say that you can listen to and feel comfortable about and say yeah that's that's right i'll listen to that that's that makes perfect sense other things it's your discretion you're the head of your household if you really think that what she's saying is not going to help you or it's something what whatever the case may be um tell her no and that's it you are the final authority in your household. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that your wife is some little slave that's supposed to be silent all the time and she can't help you try to offer some advice of her own and try to offer some sort of insight just to be a help meet to you. That's what she's doing. She's not doing it to fight you or to be con or to have mortal combat here. She wants to just help you. And she may not always have the best the best ideas for help, but at least she's trying to help you. So again, women can say wise things, and you should listen if it actually is legitimate wisdom. If it's not wise in your eyes, okay, that's, that's, your, that's your decision. You are the head of your own household. But again, men do have the final say. And, the, and she eateth not the bread of idleness. Again, another important thing too. Her not eating the bread of idleness, that is because she's a hard worker. Not eating the bread of idleness. She's not sitting around all, all day long doing nothing. She's working hard. She's finding things to do. 
You know, then in this case, Proverbs 31 woman, she is buying and uh, she is selling merchandise, making merchandise, you know, making money for her family, extra income. I mean, that's what's going on here. And on top of all that, the fact that she's praised, you know, he, her children ariseth, riseth up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Give your wife praise. I mean, make sure that you're praising her for the hard work that she does do. You know, give her that praise. She needs she needs encouragement. It's nice to receive praise, to receive a good job. You're doing a great job. That's a good thing. And if you have a wife and everything, she needs to hear that when she's working hard for you. Just like you want to hear from her. It talks about the New Testament, a woman rendering due, due benevolence to her husband. But again, the idea being is that, you know, giving praise... And with that being said, this whole passage that we just went over, clearly she is working while being married and being praised for it. If it was such a grievous sin and everything, and we'll get to the idea of careerism, we'll get to all the actual wickedness that's involved with women working here in a little bit, but if a woman working to help out her husband and help out the home is such a grievous sin, according to the common Baptist belief, then why is she being praised for it here, and why is it saying very clearly that God's pray that uh, the uh, that she is praised? Uh, verse thirty: Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And there's praise going on there for this Proverbs thirty-one woman, and yet she's doing what a lot of new, a lot of ba Baptists out there would consider nowadays a terrible sin, because it's not. Go to Acts 18. Now we will go to the New Testament. Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, verses 1, 2, 3. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius, ha Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, and he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers." They, all three, husband, wife, Paul, all three were tent makers. This woman had an occupation, and this occupation was tent maker with her husband, a team. They were both tent makers. They had the same occupation. So, again, that this right here, New Testament, this is a husband and wife team working in the same business which I think is a beautiful thing. I think that uh, one of the greatest examples I can give you is a husband and wife duo running a restaurant, you know, a f local family owned and operated nice restaurant. Uh, uh, I mean, just the, the, uh, the, uh, the awesomeness of that, the fact that they can, you know, a husband and wife team could work together and run a restaurant for their family and everything to, for a good income and I mean, you have the husband who could wind up being on anywhere between the chef and whatever else, or the wife being the chef, and then both of you are cooking together, you're filling out orders together, and when and speaking from experience, when you are married to a saved woman, you get along 200% more than the lost world ever could. A lost man and a lost woman... They can never get along the same way that a true two Bible two saved Bible believers that have been joined together in marriage can. Not happening. They would fight. They have so all kinds of stupid, different opinions on all kinds of different stuff. Maybe the hus you know maybe the husband is a conservative, but he's still lost. So he married like a halfway liberal woman who believes abortion is right, and so they'll they'll talk about that all of a sudden, and then it results in a huge back to back argument. They cuss, they cut, they cut. He cusses at her, she cusses at him because they're lost. They don't have any control over their tongues. They don't have a standard to hold to. They don't have the foundation of Christ, and eventually relationships like that spiral out of control, and then they wind up 
you know, just breaking up because in their eyes, they, they at any point they can do whatever they want and leave. You know, it's not, there's no standard. The scriptures aren't there to convict them. There's nothing there to truly bind them. They don't have the foundation of Christ. So what happens? Their, their marriage or their relationship just falls apart because they don't have any spiritual fellowship. They don't have the foundation of Christ. Um, their, their relationship's going to crumble, definitely. If they make it through, I mean, okay, but they're still, they're still going to wind up old and dying, and if they don't get saved, they, they go to hell just like anybody else, of course. But most of the time, that's what you see. That's why people, you know, there, there's a lot of talk amongst lost people where they'll say, well, I could never work with my wife and blah. Yeah, because you don't, have a, you don't, you don't love her the same way that uh, Jesus Christ does. You know, you don't you don't have the the standard of scripture, the foundation of scripture to stand on and understand that you ought to love your wife and that you both are actually one and the same. No, no. When you're when you're lost and you're two just people that have a relationship, you're just you're both different, and those differences clash and wind up uh, never being happy. But again, the idea being is that. A husband and wife, two saved people, a husband and wife working a restaurant together, that's the coolest thing in the world. I mean, that would be that would be awesome, especially, I mean, just being a team like that, being able to work together. Now, when kids, children are involved in everything, we'll get to that a little bit here in a little while and explain more about that because that is an important factor. But if you are you both don't have children and you have like a restaurant to run, that's, the, that's really cool. You know, praise the Lord. You have a, you're a team. And you get to enjoy every day with your wife working alongside her and making something, you know, working towards whatever it is, having a little bit more money for whatever reason. Maybe you need to get something fixed at the home that costs a lot, whatever the case is. But the idea being is you get to work together, and that's a beautiful thing. And according to this verse, Paul never called that sin. Paul never called it sin for two people who are married to work together uh, as a team in their in their own business if tent i don't know if it doesn't say if they worked for anybody or not or if they work for themselves but they were working together praise the lord so again uh also it does not it doesn't say they were in a financial bind i have to point that out now i'm not going to try to sit here and say that women should just work for no real good reason if they just want to uh, don't get me wrong i'm not saying to be covetous or anything like that but i'm saying you could really look at this either way because it doesn't say if they were in a financial bind or not. But it also doesn't say that she was just working with him just to work with him. Because she wanted to, for no real good reason. So you could look at this either way. I mean, obviously, in light of the other scriptures that we'll get into, I would say that on the side of caution, if the woman, if, uh, if they were working together for extra income, that's one thing. But again, it's, it's really hard to say. But what I do know is, is that her working with her husband put her under his headship all the time. So there's no better place for a woman to be as far as work goes than working alongside her husband. They're, you know, she, a, she's a companion. They're a team. And not to be covetous, of course. And now, now go to t Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the younger, the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So you see, older women teach younger women to love their families. I mean, as an older woman, especially an older woman in Christ, uh, if you have a younger sister out there that, that's coming to you for advice, that, that's what you ought to teach her. Teach her how to love her husband, how to love her family. You know, it's a, that's a beautiful thing, and that's for older women out there to minister to younger women in Christ. You know, something that, that they can use, something that can really help them in their family, things like that. So, again, to, in today's world, among the lost is the complete opposite. 
Among the lost in today's world, I mean, women are gossiping and speaking wickedly of their husbands to these other women, the, these older women. You'll hear all the stupidity going on. I mean, literally, women will just complain about their, I mean, lost women will just complain about their husbands and say how they did this and that, that they don't like. And then the older women, instead of telling them to shut their mouths and, you know, and love their husband and get over his differences and get over his mistakes... No, they, instead they're going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, you, should, you shouldn't even take that, you know, and they, they, that's how they talk. They love to gossip and speak wickedly, and they'll feed into that wickedness that the, that the lost woman's already speaking about her boyfriend or husband, whatever, uh, and then it just winds up making the whole, the whole thing worse. That's not the way it's supposed to be. If you're, older, if you're an older woman in Christ, and for some reason you're hearing a younger sister complain about her husband, you are to correct her, rebuke her sharply, and say, Look, he may have some issues, but you you, you get back in there and you keep loving your husband. He's, he's not going to be perfect, and neither are you, but for that matter. You know, praise the Lord. That's the way it should be. Not this feed their, you know, feed their, neg their negative issues, feed their their uh, wickedness about their boyfriends or husbands and cause even more fights. No, that's not, that's not the way at all. But that's what the lost world does. And there's nothing holy or honorable about that. That's complete wickedness and shame. Disgusting. And that they, they have TV shows about it. You know, uh, you can look at reality shows about women just speaking badly about their husbands and all this wicked stuff. It, uh, it's disgusting. But again, the woman's primary occupation is keeping the home. They are to keep the home. Absolutely. You know, loving her family. Those are first and foremost the woman's occupation. It's not about being career-minded. It's about being home-minded. You are to be home-minded, not career-minded. So again, uh, that's and if work gets in the way of that, you must choose the home 100% of the time. Let's just say, for example, you do wind up having to work outside the home for extra income or whatever the case is. And then uh, say, say you can't work alongside your husband. Say you can't work in the same occupation as him. There's just something blocking you from that. There's no real way to work as a husband-wife team to have his headship over you. So then the other, only other alternative you find is maybe you have to work outside the home to help with income and everything. And then all of a sudden you find yourself, uh, your, your family is in some, something's going on and you're actually at a, a area where you have to choose between the job or the family. Well, you better choose the family 100% of the time. That's your obligation. You are, your first and foremost occupation is being the keeper at home. So if there is an issue, there is a, a, a thing where you do actually have to go out and work because there's just the income is not there for whatever reason, uh, if it starts getting in the way of your family, you quit that job as quickly as possible. Your family is the most important thing. And if you start if you start to forsake that and everything, you start to forsake that and you go into this career-minded mode, you're wa you're definitely walking right into sin territory. You're going to be in sin for doing things like that. And one of the positives of today, of today actually is the work from home remote opportunities. The thing is, is nowadays, for those of you out there who have this issue where you do have wives that have to work, your income just isn't there. The, I mean, I get it. Our country has been stripped of a lot of good, high-paying jobs that people used to be able to get no matter what. They didn't need a college education. They didn't need any of that. All they needed was their promise that they were a hard worker, a pretty halfway decent resume, a willingness to work whenever their boss needed them, because that's what they actually work, look for in the workforce. They look for somebody who's willing to work whenever. They won't actually make you work whenever, of course, but when you offer up that willingness to them in a job interview, it definitely makes a difference for you. But the idea being is that we have been stripped of all those things that made it to where a man could be the sole income earner of his house. Well, if he doesn't need financial help, the woman shouldn't really be working. She could be getting crafty and making things on the side, and even if she wants to run her own side business and sell things from home, uh, absolutely. But she doesn't have to work outside the home if the income's good, according to, uh, according to the husband. Everything's fine. So, But the cool part is, about today, really, is that we have work-from-home opportunities. We have things that you can look for online, 
a lot of, uh, from what I've, from what I understand, a lot of customer service jobs where you just simply work from home and you answer the phone for customers and stuff like that via internet and you help a problem or things like that. There's all kinds of opportunities right now uh, for women to work from home if they need to, to help the family. So again, uh, if you can't work with your husband and everything and you need the income, look into a part-time job from home if you absolutely have to. This is the idea is that you don't work for covetousness. You can't just, it, you're can't. you a keeper of the home. So when you have children and everything involved, your attention goes 100% to them. But in the case of low income, you're having there's a bunch of issues going on. You're just not getting by. Yeah, as a help me to your husband, you have to help him with that income. And if it starts to interfere with the family, give it up. Because if you can't, if if it does that to you, that the family is far more important than extra income. But that being said, that's married women. So the idea being is that according to the scriptures, married women can very much work as a team with their husband in some sort of business, things like that. And then if it's absolutely necessary, a woman can work outside the home if they need the extra income. It's not sin. It's not sinful. When it, it becomes sinful, when you start to forsake the occupation of being a keeper of the home. And if you have children and everything, and it's between you going in and getting a job or putting them in the public school system and letting them get indoctrinated into evolution, all those wicked views, yeah, uh, you forsake the job, stay home with your children and find a way. You don't want to have to go through that because public school is very wicked. There's nothing good that comes out of that thing. They learn a lot of basic skills, math, English, sure, but don't put them through it because they will, they'll try to indoctrinate them in all these wicked things that the state wants them to be taught. So again, those are the areas where you need to just, if that's what it comes down to between family or the job, you choose the family as a woman. So that is what the scriptures say about a married woman and working. It's not sin. Can it become sin? Yeah, 100%. If you get career-minded, you start falling into the love of money, you start forsaking your family, you start almost like seeking promotions and all the stuff that really your husband should be looking for, not you, you're in sin territory. But what about young, what about young unmarried women? That's a great question too. So 1 Timothy 5.14. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 14. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So you see right there, younger women are to marry, to seek a husband. They also are to seek to have children and guide their house. That is exactly the, the desire a young woman should have is to be married and to have children to be a guide of the, to guide the house to be a keeper at home that is the desire and that's why again like i said with before if your desire to be a keeper of the home is being attacked by by the job that you're working and it's somehow starting to go to your head leave the job can't stress that enough Again, and it's not to be career-minded. Career-mindedness is very much a sin for a woman. It's very much a sin for a woman to sit there and think, well, I would love to be the CEO of Apple Computer. No, 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 no. It's simply just to help out with the income for your husband, or you could be a team with your husband. Maybe you both have your own little small business or company, and you're there to help them. Perfectly fine. Scripture doesn't say you're in sin for that. But are you putting your kids in public school to go work that job, even with your husband? Mm. At that point, you ought to consider staying home with them because you don't want to put you don't want to put your children through this garbage called public school, public indoctrination. First Corinthians eleven. First Corinthians eleven verses two to fifteen.
1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 to 15. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head uncovered, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is, sh it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. So you see right there, the whole thing, the reason that I read this passage is that a lot of people tend to think that this is for physical head coverings. I don't believe it is at all. I believe this is a spiritual head covering, and that head covering would be the man covering the wife. The reason being is that whole section where it talks about being shorn and everything. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. So, essentially, this doesn't really seem like it's talking about just head coverings. It's talking to, I believe it's talking about spiritual head coverings, meaning it's a spiritual type of passage comparing it to physical things. So, the idea being is that the head of the woman is the man. That is her spiritual head covering. And before it is the man that she's married to, before that it would be her, her uh, father, would be her spiritual head covering. So, women need to have a head covering, whether it's a father or a husband. So, they need a man to lead and guide them to be their head covering. And that's the thing. Women need that head covering. They need... To have someone there to actually watch over them. To have that that leader and everything. So when a woman goes off to work outside the home, she doesn't have you there. She doesn't have her head covering. And Satan, Satan goes after women when they're alone and everything like that. Satan does attack the woman first. It's very, very evident throughout scripture. So... Again, that's why working outside the home should be a last resort priority to where it's it's either she works outside the home or you both will just never meet your bills. And yeah, of course, that's something that you have to you have to look at and if it's if it's the only way, it's the only way. Absolutely. It doesn't say that it's sinful, but the idea being is when she leaves your your supervision and everything and you don't you're not there to be her head covering, it, it could cause problems. And that's why it's best to, if you really need your wife to work, to have her look into something from home or to work with you if the option's available. That's the protocols that Scripture makes pretty clear. So, again, the idea being is a woman needs a spiritual head covering. And without it, uh, the, the Satan will attack her. And on that same note, for you women out there, if you do have to work outside the home, if that really is... All you have right now, at least for right now, uh, you need to pray and be strong about that because your husband's not there to look after you. You need to be uh, strong and be vigilant. You know, remember, the devil walks, walks about seeking whom he may devour. In 1 Samuel 8. So young women are to... Seek marriage, not career. First Samuel chapter eight. 
1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his son judges his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba, and his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all, in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do, th do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king, and he said, This will be, this will be, the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands, and captains over fifties, and will set them to ear his ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries, and to be cooks, and to be bakers. So again, you see right there, the whole thing of the Lord gives them a king, which if you read the book of Samuel, you'll find you'll learn later about King Saul. And later on, it proves not very good. You read more about King Saul and that whole story and how that whole thing turned out. It proves not to be very good. A result of Israel's bad decision puts young women working outside the home. Interesting passage. So a result of Israel's bad decision was women being taken and working outside the home in a bakery as cooks and so on and so forth. So young women who, from what I can see in this passage, were not married, were taken out of the home when they were waiting for husbands, essentially, and pro probably waiting to be married, and they were put in as baker bakers and a bakery and cooks. Very interesting passage. So again... A result of Israel's bad decision puts young women working outside the home. Now, it doesn't say that it's sin, but it's the result. And America is very much in the same boat. That's exactly what we're facing right now. Uh, that's exactly why some of you out there may have to have your wives work right now, because your jobs just aren't cutting it. It's not anything that you're doing. You may be working as hard as you can, as diligently, and putting in as many hours, but it still just doesn't meet the high amounts of bills, mortgages, rent, all the stuff that is flat out very much uh, unreasonable at times. So I get it completely. And we're in the same boat essentially as Israel, where our, our old jobs from the old, the old ways and everything where people could make a good living by working in, say, a factory or another job that just paid really well, that's gone now. Now there's a lot of Jobs that are very much dead-end jobs, unless you work really hard and they're, you're being recognized and they would consider promoting you, that's great. Praise the Lord if that's happening for you, but some of you may not be. And you may be working as hard as you can, you're just not being recognized. I get it. Totally. But that's what we have here in America today. Considering these verses, I can't call a young woman working before she has a husband sin necessarily. But if you, if you have to work with your, you know, while you're waiting for a husband, if you're a young woman out there, if you have to work while you're waiting for a husband because of your parents, you know, etc., parents will push you into careerism, they'll try to get you to get a job because they want you to move out when you're 18, that's the new, the mindset of people nowadays, the lost people, they want their children out by the time they're 18, 
on their own, whether even, I mean, whether it's man or woman, they want to force you out even if you don't have a husband yet. So I get that. But again, uh, I mean, that's, that's the whole thing. And if you are working because your parents are making you do it and you want to wait for a husband, I mean, I don't see any sin in that. However, it's sin when you care more about the job than your family. If you start to get into a job and you were originally waiting for a husband and you were trying to just relax and not work and wait for a husband and everything, uh, and then all of a sudden you find yourself working and then you find yourself thinking that you want to move up in this business, you want to make a bonus, you want to make a higher salary, whatever the case, and all of a sudden your thoughts of the family and things start to drift away from you and you start to not care as much about that considering the money you could be making, you're in a danger zone. You are very much in sin. You are falling into a snare. You are falling into covetousness, the love of money. Stop. Simple. That's, that's the way you got to treat it. Satan goes after women that are alone. They need to be strong if there's no choice. You need to be strong. You need to pray fervently, be strong, and seek out a husband, a good Bible-believing, saved husband. And with that, we're going to go ahead and close with 1 Timothy 5.8. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So, the man is the head of the household. See, a man, his own house, his household. You are the primary income earner if you are the man. It is your job to make the primary amount of income. You are the person that should be providing for the household, 100%. And also, just to also say something else, being content with food and raiment, because there is that other scripture as well later on in the New Testament, that does not mean that you should be homeless. I've heard, I've heard some people out there try to say that, well, we're supposed to be content with food, content with food and raiment, so... Uh, I work a really bad, you know, really bad job that doesn't pay very well, so I'm just going to continue living with my parents with my wife. No. Uh, you better start. If you're someone who's actually thinking that way, that it's just about food and raiment, you're not supposed to try to take the next step and work harder and get a better, earn a better life for your family and try to seek out buying your own house and things like that, and you think that you're just supposed to settle for mediocrity and, and live in a squalor and, and everything. And, and if you really have a job that doesn't pay that well and that's what you're having to do, uh, that's, the, that's the time where it may be time to start talking to your wife about getting a little bit of help. And that's another thing too. There's a certain amount of pride that's in there where a man who ha does have a bad job and there's not much he can really do about it, well, he thinks, well, I just have to keep Going in circles, I just, I can't have my wife work, that's sin, that's sin, it, I, I'll be wrong with God, and blah, no, no you're not, just keep an eye on things, and if you're at a job where you can get your wife working with you, do that, that is the best route to take, if you're in that much of a bind, but don't sit there and be prideful, and if you see the scriptures and what they actually say, and how they allow for things like that, don't be prideful and say, well, uh, uh, I'm just going to, uh, no, because I need to be the one to, I need, your wife is your help me. Drop your pride, and if you need to, ask her to come in and help. There's a lot of pride there with that. It's not just, honoring God is very important, absolutely. Our lives need to reflect the Lord, and we want to do everything we can to please him. But the Bible, as we've seen from these scriptures, never actually says that a woman working is sin. It's sin when she's taken from the household, from the household, from her, from the children. When she, her mind's not, her heart's not on the house and being there for her children, and she becomes career-minded. That's when it becomes sin. But being there to help you with the income, or being there to be your teammate in a business, it's not wrong. So if you're someone out there who's consumed, consumed in that kind of pride, let it go. Ask her to help you. Get yourself out of that bind, and get yourself onto something a little bit better. Again, when jobs were good, we didn't, no man needed help. When jobs were good, 
no man needed a woman to step in and work and help him in, in the household. It just wasn't there. The jobs were perfectly fine. People were making a good income. Having a retirement, even though I don't necessarily believe in stopping working, I don't, I don't, retirement's one thing. Let me say that. It's not, this is a whole different study for a different time, but retirement's okay for a residual passive income. But if you think that when you retire, you should stop working, I disagree. I think you should keep working and go to a new job and just keep on working. But that's a whole, whole nother study for a different time, just to throw that out there. But there was a time where we never, where men never needed help from their, from their wives. Their wives could comfortably stay at home and could comfortably take care of the children without any worries of the finances. And Satan has made things difficult. <laughs> Satan has destroyed a lot of that. And that's why we are put into these situations. That's why there are situations out there, a lot of you brethren may be facing them, where you're in this grip, so to speak, of just financial bind and you feel like there's no way out. But you do have a wife right there the Lord's provided for you that can't help you if, that, if, it's, if that's the case. But closing statements. It is not wrong for a woman to work if the income is needed, or to be a team with her husband. It's not wrong, as we, saw, I was, as we saw by the scriptures. If work takes your heart away from your family, stop immediately. Dead serious. You don't want the Lord to get angry with you. Stop immediately if work takes your heart away from your family. If you're, if you're a young woman out there, a young married woman. And no career minded, no career mindedness. This is just to help. And if you're a young woman, I would recommend you stay at home until until the Lord brings you a husband. But if your parents will force you into it, I get it. And if you get into a job, just don't look at it as a long term thing. Look at it as short term until the Lord brings you your husband, because he will. Trust him on that. He intends for young women to marry. He's not going to let you go without a husband. It's in his word. His word's not. Uh, he doesn't contradict his own word. But, again, it should be just to help. Just to help the household finances. Not this career-mindedness that I'm going to go places in this business. No, no, no. Your place is at home with your children. Loving your husband, loving your family. Your husband is your head. So if he tells you to quit, even if it doesn't make sense, you are to listen to him. That's another thing, too. Your husband's still your head. If, there's, if that, that's the kind of situation some of you out there may be in, remember, your husband's your head, and at any time if your husband says, you know what, I don't want you going to this job anymore, I want you to stop, I want you here with me. You know, I want you to stay home, I want you to be home. Even if it doesn't make sense, listen to him. He's the, he's the authority. And that's not, something, that's not something that's wicked or anything like that. He may be saying that for a very good reason, and if that's the way he feels about things, listen. So, with that being said, that is the end of this study. I do pray that this is a blessing to you out there. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank you for watching Authorized Version Bible Thumper Ministries. James chapter 4 and verse 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. The gospel is this, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Friend, you are not a good person. Romans chapter 3, verses 19 to 23. Now we know what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Have you ever lied, cheated, fornicated, or even killed? James 2 verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You have sinned against a perfect, holy God. 
The punishment for sin is eternal hell. Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 to 30. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 11 Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Do you fear God? Are you sorry for your sins? Are you desperate for salvation? A new life? 2 Corinthians 7.10 For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. The Good News 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day for your personal sins against God, so that you can be justified. Romans 3 verse 24 Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 to 13 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on the Lord, ask for the free gift, and receive the new birth today. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new.